Ladies and gentlemen, from now on, when I say the three Ps, those are the three Ps. They should be in that order. These can no longer be rearranged. The order means something. They are the Peace of Paris, Pontiac's Rebellion, and the Proclamation of 1763. Each one of them is going to cause a different problem situation. And again, when I say problem, some of them appear to be a good thing. At this moment, there is about to become a chain reaction. Ladies and gentlemen, Peace of Paris. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, in simple terms, and folks, the Peace of Paris is the treaty to end the French Indian War. That is very simple. That is very short. That is very cut and dry. The problem is, because this is an important event, we are going to need a little bit more description. We're going to need a little bit more detail. So in the Peace of Paris of 1763, which ends the French Indian War, in the Peace of Paris, England gets the Ohio Valley. That makes sense, because that's what the war was about, correct? The bigger shock, England will get all of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, the problem is you are looking at this as a map. You are looking at this in terms of, oh my gosh, look at how much land. You're doing it wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to think of this in terms of mercantilism. Did the French really give a crap about the land? Were they building large farms and fields? No, to the French it was fur trading. Think of mercantilism. Ladies and gentlemen, in the French Indian War, the French forfeit. Because remember, when they lost Ohio, the English won it. The English won it, and what happens? If the English begin to settle it, that is going to disrupt the fur trade anyway. The French make the decision that they are going to abandon the fur trading land, and the England acquire it. Now, there's a couple of other parts of the treaty. England by land, and that's all most of you are thinking, wow, they get all of that and that. However, the French will get back the islands of Guadalupe and Martinique. Both of them have been captured by England. The French will also be given two islands, little itty bitty specks of dust, off of Newfoundland. Ladies and gentlemen, these are little islands. They're not specifically where you're going to need to know the name. And once again, what is the biggest thing you're thinking of? You're thinking of the land. Wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, the two islands off Newfoundland were the fishing and whaling. The French were able to protect a whaling and fishing interest. They kept the two islands off Newfoundland to keep the fishing. And what is the Martinique and Guadalupe about? Sugar, sugar cane. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time in history, the French are not looking at this. Go back to mercantilism. Colonies are for what purpose? Raw materials. In the Peace of Paris, the French abandoned the fur trade, but they are able to protect their fishing and whaling and they are able to protect the sugar cane. French surrender. Well, it's, when you say that they surrender, I mean, they, they, get, they surrender, they're beaten at Quebec and Montreal. There are other places in the world that the French do not surrender. They continue to fight. I mean, clearly France itself never surrendered. So, if England hates France so much, why, like, in the tech we won the war, why did we, what you have to understand is there are other possessions in other places that would be a problem. There is still the 80,000 Frenchmen living in Canada. So under this issue, basically what happens is the French make a deal where the people living in, in Canada are encouraged to either leave or to basically stay and remain loyal to England. Remember, a lot of this is at this time, remember, think of how they fought war. You line up on a battlefield, both sides with standing iron formation, and it's simply a contest of honor. This agreement was basically how they worked it out. Please understand, France has not been defeated. I mean, France is still a very powerful, viable threat. In this war, they basically decided to end the war for North America, or the end the war for America, and, <coughs> and this is what they worked out. If you don't give the French any reason to stop, they're gonna keep fighting, and they will spread the war on the ocean. They will take the war back home. Because remember, in Europe, England has the advantage of their navy, and that will be the same throughout our entire class. Inside Europe, France is a big country. France has a large army. So France can be a pain in the butt with issues inside of Europe. There's one other item you might want to be aware of. Technically, the naughty Spanish did help the French. The other part of the agreement is the Spanish will be allowed to retain Cuba, the Philippines, and of course, Florida. There's 
one more item you might want to sneak in here. And folks, this is one that is more for the very, very clever and very top of the line. If you don't want to consider yourself, the idea would be why you're here. There was a secret treaty. Ladies and gentlemen, Europeans are crazy. They're like, they, it's like they were trying to make movies. There was a secret treaty. Ladies and gentlemen, now that England had so much land and was becoming so powerful, France was beginning to be afraid of the amount of resources and what this could mean to England. The French owned something else. The French owned this. That is New Orleans, the mouth of the Mississippi River. At this time in history, it's referred to as Louisiana. Louisiana is the Mississippi to the Rockies. Prior to signing the Peace of Paris, the French secretly gave Louisiana, most importantly, New Orleans, to the Spanish. Why? They do not want England to have it. Why does everybody care so much about Louisiana? New Because it's one of those situations that the English were probably hoping that they could extend all the way across. Remember, there is still a lot of uncertainty of how big this is. The reason New Orleans, and everybody knew it, folks, we are going to see this very, very quickly. New Orleans is the access point of the Mississippi. People are not stupid. It's the same as the St. Lawrence River. The St. Lawrence basically takes you from the ocean into the Great Lakes. The Mississippi takes you from the Midwest to the ocean. That's literally what the French are going to protect. So is there like a big settlement there at this point? There is a town. The problem is there wasn't much in here. The French would use it. They would basically float furs down, and they would come out, and there was a trading center here, right? So the French could go this way or this way. The English now own this, and the English don't want it for fur trading. They want it for what? Settlement. They're going to build houses and farms. What is the French thinking? As the French build stuff here, this land is worthless if you don't have a way to do what? To get it to market. The only place that you have to be able to make a market is down the Mississippi River. So please understand, this was that one item that the English really did not understand, that they were not probably getting New Orleans. And of course, when it comes out, the French will much more be like, oh, that was, you know, we had already given that. We had already made a deal. That was part of something else. Ladies and gentlemen, there's the Peace of Paris. Most important thing is at the end of the war, England just got a whole bunch of land. Yippee! And of course, every single man who's living in the 13 counties, what do they believe? We won. We won, we get crap. Head out there and take land. Folks, Chief Pontiac was an Indian who was allied to the English. He was a good guy. And do you know where the problem comes in? Pontiac and his Allies were very, very, very important to the war. Follow your brain through. We won the war. Settlers moved to the frontier. The English all of a sudden are going, wait a second. We fought. We helped. We helped you beat the French. And in the Indians' mind, what was the purpose of the war supposed to be? Ladies and gentlemen, the Indians believed that we all agreed to fight, stop the French, stop the Huron, and protect the land for the fur trade. The, the Indians had never been told we were going to kill the French, kill the Huron, and basically have in, you know, settlers overrun us. The Indians believe, Pontiac, that they were betrayed. So what do they do? They begin to go up and down the frontier, and every white Englishman they see on a wagon, they kill them. As soon as white settlers begin to be killed, what immediately is the cry? Help! Kill them! Bad, bad Indians! Life, liberty, property, go get them. And now when I say go get them, who should go get them? Redcoats, go get them. Can anyone tell me, why are the English going to have some concern about this? What is the problem with this? Pontiac is killing settlers. Settlers are begging for help. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't even know if it's they want to. The Indians, or the English believe in honor, correct? Flat out, what do the English have with the natives? They had a deal. And ladies and gentlemen, there are people in England that are very concerned, what does it say? What does, you know, what, you know, what is the reflection if we break a deal? Ladies and gentlemen, flat out, did England believe the militias were worth anything in terms of fighting? Folks, remember I told you there was one point some million settlers and there was what, 80,000 French? What was the point of that? From England's point of view, why are those numbers? Why do I tell you the numbers? If there's so many of you and so few of them, come you couldn't protect your own crap. 
you guys are worthless, right? The Indians, and part of I think I'll go with what Griffin said. Do we really want to pick a fight with them? I mean, it would take time, it would be expensive, and I already gave you, that's the other item. Folks, the French, remember William Pitt, who by the way has already been fired? Crazy guy. He won, thank you, get out of here. He did his job, we're gonna find a sane person now, and we'll deal with that. Ladies and gentlemen, please identify the other issue when you think of Pontiac's rebellion, you wanna think about his money. And folks, the money, the colonists don't care, right? The colonists are used to, where do we, who, who pays for everything? Mom, it's your job, life, liberty, property, life, liberty, property, go do it, go do it, go do it. Does everybody understand Pontiac's rebellion is a cause, or an effect, depending on how you wanna say that, of the Peace of Paris, yes? Because of the Peace of Paris, settlers move to the frontier. Because settlers move to the frontier, the Indians get mad, they begin to attack. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need now is a solution. I would, I would argue to you, the third P is probably the most important. It is the most significant. This is where the problems begin. Ladies and gentlemen, the third P is the Proclamation of 1763. This is where, you know what? England believes they're brilliant. England believes they came up with a wonderful solution. It isn't going to work that well. Look at the map. Here's the situation. The English just won that and that. The problem is the English, the settlers, believe they want this. They want it. They want to go here. The Indians, who helped you beat the French, believe it should be for them. In the proclamation of 1763, England makes this announcement. This is the proclamation. Remember the French forts? Fort Duquesne? They're still there, right? The proclamation of 1763. England announces they are going to fortify those forts and they are going to put British soldiers in America for the first time ever, for the first time ever. There will be British soldiers in America. Basically from New York down to Virginia, there will be British soldiers. Ladies and gentlemen, under the proclamation, the British army is to act as a buffer. This would be for colonists. Indians, go away. All land here would be for natives and licensed fur traders. So again, do not say that no, no colonist. We still are going to fur trade. That's the proclamation. Ladies and gentlemen, it stops Pontiac's rebellion. It stops killing people. We do not cause a war with the natives. It allows for fur trading. At this point, if you want to understand the proclamation, you need to be a little more thorough. What will Chief Pontiac and the natives think of this agreement? Ladies and gentlemen, the natives are thrilled. What did I tell you? The rebellion stops. The Indians believed that this was a good solution. The white man has his land, the Indians have their land, and there's a dividing force in the middle. That would be the British Army. The British Army is literally supposed to keep the peace. Colonists, what is their opinion? Ladies and gentlemen, number one, it's like spoiled children. The colonists are now yelling and arguing, we won, we won, we won. How come you're giving it to the Indians? It's kind of like in a family. Why are you favoring them? So ladies and gentlemen, the first item is the colonists believe we won. We should get it. There's two other issues you need to be able to have a reference to. Ladies and gentlemen, number two, there's British soldiers in America. Some of you are like, well, that's a good thing. Okay, now think about it. Ladies and gentlemen, there are British soldiers under the proclamation to keep the peace. Now, put yourself in the perspective of a colonist. If you're a colonist, does it appear that the soldiers are attacking and killing the Indians like they're supposed to? No. no. Are they there to fight the French? Why? The French are gone. Are they there to kill the Spanish? No. Because where are they? Way to the south. No, not the Indians. Not the French. Not the Indians. Who's left? Ladies and gentlemen, what I want to understand is the argument that begins to spread through the colonies is the proclamation is designed to be controlled. England is concerned. Remember like the Dominion New England? The colonies are growing too fast. The colonies are getting kind of out of control. They're becoming too independent. And people in the colonies begin to believe this is an example of control, that they are going to restrain, that they are going to use this to start monitoring the counties. The British army is there to be more of a, dis of a representative of the king against the colonists. Is that true? Not really, but it's what the counties begin to decipher.
Does anybody know what is the third problem of the proclamation? What is it that the colonists are angry about, really? They want what? What land? Ohio. Who stands in their way? Is it really the British Army in their way? Who's in your way? Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize what these people have done to try to get a new life? They cross the ocean, they put up with disease. Folks, what is the law? The British now occupy a string of forts that are spread out every 7,500 miles. The colonists continue to go out there. That creates a very weird situation for the British because they've told them not to. The problem is, are the British going to necessarily arrest, apprehend people in conflict with Indians? The colonists who go out there are basically going without the support and protection of the British Army. You are going on your own. So think of the two-pronged problem. When colonists continue to go to Ohio, first of all, what are they doing? They're breaking the law. They're ignoring who? Okay. The colonists who make it to the frontier, they're learning who do they have to be relying on? Themselves. They are not getting help from whom? Ladies and gentlemen, there begins to be, depending on your situation, some of that, what do we need England for? They're not helping us. And in a second, they're going to want money. So ladies and gentlemen, where we at right now is those are our three Ps. Ladies and gentlemen, I will say that a lot. I will sometimes say it fast. Sometimes I will say it as sure sounds dumb to take Cleveland. Sometimes I will go sugar stamp that toy town shanty worship. Here's the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, the colonists do not like the proclamation. The French Indian War was expensive. In 1764, what did I tell you? William Pitt is gone. Please write down. Governor is George Grenville. G all right, it's actually EE. -E. It looks like Greenville. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Grenville's not a soldier. He's lighter. You know what? He's a businessman. He's a banker. George Grenville comes in after William Pitt and was the number one thing Grenville is going to be focused on? Money. Specifically, what is the issue? The French Union War was really expensive. Mama is kind of hemorrhaging money. England needs to tighten up a little bit. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to be crystal clear. England paid for the French Indian War. Ladies and gentlemen, George Grenville decides the colonists are big enough that they should be to help. Specifically, they should be to pay for their own needs. Under the proclamation, England had to put an army in America to do what? What is that army there for from England's perspective? What do armies do? What's the number? Remember, think of mercantilism. What is mama's job? Protect. Ladies and gentlemen, there is an army in America designed to protect who? Is that, are they protecting England? They're protecting the colonies. Ladies and gentlemen, in very simple terms, George Grenville decides that 13 colonies should pay for proclamation. The proclamation is something that is for the benefit of the colonies. England is having financial problems. The decision is made that the colonies should be responsible for raising the money to pay for this. For those of you who want to be accurate, that is the amount of money we have. We need to raise 260,000 pounds a year. That's an English currency sign. That is how much the proclamation costs. That is what England wants. Ladies and gentlemen, as we begin to start the Sugar Act, which is the next item, George Grenville wants money to pay for the proclamation. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1764, George Grenville imposes the Sugar Act. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1764, the Prime Minister of England, George Grenville, announces you're going to pay taxes. In fact, we're going to get to that in a second. Is this the first tax the colonies have ever had? In fact, there's a lot of taxes. The big philosophical difference is what is Mama, for the first time ever, saying? You need to pay. Does everybody understand that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the tax that we will talk about right here is the sugar tax, or the sugar act, whichever. Ladies and gentlemen, the sugar tax is a tax on sugar, coffee, and wine. So even though it says sugar act, it is actually a copy of three products, sugar, coffee, and wine. Very common, very normal products.